Thank you for that, Rihanna. And um, I sometimes think when people talk about me that that's not me, that's somebody else. That person's far too flush for me. Um, firstly, I'd like to, and most importantly, I'd like to acknowledge the Turrbal and Yarraga people on whose country we meet today. And I'd particularly like to thank Baringa for that wonderful welcome. Um, welcome to country is really important and I wanna pay my respects to their elders past and present. I do that not just because it's protocol to do it. It's actually a sincere thank you from me for welcoming us onto their country and affording us the privilege and the comfort that makes us feel like we belong. It's incredibly important to belong somewhere, even if it's for a short period of time for a particular thing. But that's what welcome to country is. It makes us feel like we have a place and we belong. So before I go further, there's probably two caveats I need to put on today's talk. Number one, even though I wrote this, I do ad lib. You'll be able to pick it when I do. So I just want to put that there. And the other one is it's always dangerous to give me a microphone, an audience and a licence to say what I want. <laughs> so thank you for asking me to do this today, Rachel. But you never know, you might regret that soon. <laughs> I hope not. Um, but I'll do my best. The other thing is too, there are no slides, there's no PowerPoint. I don't use PowerPoint if I can help it. So um, no death by PowerPoint today, so you're in luck. What you've got to look at is me, which in itself mightn't be a great thing, but we'll just work with that. I'd also like to particularly acknowledge uh, the other commissioners who are online and with us today, and I'd also and especially like to acknowledge the other Aboriginal people in the room today. It's incredibly important to do that as a matter of protocol. It's incredibly important because it's saying that Aboriginal people have a place in these discussions, that we belong here as well. I'd also like to acknowledge Dr David Solomon. As you all know, his commitment to not only transparency of government, but the principle that people have a right to know is why we're here today. And I hope to honour and continue the work that he has dedicated his, his life to. But before I go further, I do want to make something clear. I'm not here to beat anyone up. I'm not here to recount the historical truths that are becoming increasingly known by ordinary Australians. I would encourage you, though, to watch the excellent series on SBS, The Australian Wars, as the next step in your learning, as the next step of information to teach you about the whole history of our country. Rather than talk about the what, I want to discuss the why. Why is it important? Why looking through the eyes of Aboriginal people is important? What does it bring to us as individuals and as a nation? How does it add to who we are? More deeply, why do, why do I, as an Aboriginal ma man, believe it is important for me to revisit painful events? What good can come of it for me and for others? Truthfully, I've asked myself that question many, many times. Why do I do this to myself? The answers like the questions are many varied and changing and challenging. So let's start with the example I know well, the individual, specifically the one I know best, me. I am one of the stolen generations, or as I prefer to call, prefer to call us, the stolen children. <coughs> because that's what we were, children. I sometimes think the term members of the stolen generations makes it sound like some sort of a club. Trust me, it's not a club you want to belong to. As you would appreciate, for me, finding who I was born, where I was from, was paramount. Put simply, how would I know, how do I know where I should be going if I don't know where I'm from and where I have been? The vacuum of knowing how I came about was for me like a black hole, a vast expanse of nothingness that held its secrets with no chance of anything escaping. I was separated from my family, community, culture and country when I was three weeks old. The nothingness of knowing anything was real. Except this black hole had left two breadcrumbs for me. My adopted mum told me when she and dad picked me up at the adoption home, the woman who handed me over said to her, I shouldn't be telling you this, we're not supposed to. But besides being Aboriginal, he has some Indian blood in him and he was given the name Andrew James. Two Christian names. In the scheme of things, these seemingly big breadcrumbs 
These were seemingly big breadcrumbs, except to a child, they were almost meaningless. I was just growing up in Yarrawonga in Victoria, one of three Aboriginal children in a town of 3,200 people. The other two were my sisters, also Aboriginal babies adopted by mum and dad. It wasn't until I was 18 and left Yarrawonga to go to college in Bendigo that these two bits of information came into their own. Information takes many forms. And it was these two things which probably made the biggest impact on who I am. In talking to one of the first Aboriginal people I met, apart from my sisters, he asked me if I knew anything about myself. So I told him, thinking it would be as mystifying and as meaningless to him as it was to me. He looked at me and said, ah, okay, I think I know who you are. Leave it with me and I'll get back to you. This was the first time I also learned about the concept of curry time <laughs> or Aboriginal time or whatever you want to call it. Um, so get back to you in whitefellas terms might mean a week, a fortnight. Six months later, <laughs> someone gets back to me. Evidently, my information was passed on the Victorian Aboriginal Child Care Agency who looked into it. A caseworker came up to Bendigo and took me through my story, who I was who I was born, who my birth family was, what my name was. And as it turns out, Andrew James weren't two Christian names, but one Christian name, Andrew, and a surname, James. Suddenly I had a whole lot of information. That, by the way, is one half hour of my life I will never, ever forget. Actually, it was probably an hour, but it just seemed, it just went so quick, and yet I had all this stuff. I had a name. I had siblings, I had cousins, I had uncles and aunties. I had a place, Shepparton. I had a mother who died in 1966, two years after I was born. Another black hole, another vacuum. To cut to the chase, I met my birth family and have a wonderful relationship with them. They are my family and they ground me in my Aboriginality. I am also just as much a part of the family that adopted me and brought me up. But the one event that I will never forget to this day is the, is the day I got my papers. You know the papers? The ones most people don't have. The, one, the ones that have your original birth certificate before you were adopted and given a new birth certificate the one that has your mother's name on it, the one that has your name on it. And other papers as well. Particularly, there is one that I call the document that changed me and created two people. This one starts off identifying me as one person, as one person, Andrew James. And at the end of it, it identifies me as another person, Ian Hamm. I'm still the same person, but on that day, that paper creates two people. The Andrew James, who might have been, and the Ian Ham, who is. How important was it for me to get these documents? You can't imagine it. Up to this day, up, up until that day, the day I sat in a room with other adoptees, all non-Aboriginal, by the way, everything I'd learned about myself from my families and others was still unconfirmed, at least in my mind, if not in the minds of others. Am I really Andrew James, or has there been a dreadful mistake? What do I do if, I've, if, if someone says to me, prove it? What if I'm someone else? Does that mean I have to start all over again? Can I do this again? I'm not sure. Thankfully, I didn't have to contemplate this scenario. The documents confirmed everything I'd been told. And it was all there in black and white on paper. In my eyes, though, these weren't just a set of papers. They were confirmation that I existed, that I am real. My story is just one of the thousands of similar stories of the stolen children. Who am I? Where am I from? And for those who are taken as older children, these questions of finding your way home is just as real. Every time a stolen person is returned to their country or returns to their family, 
it's with great joy and great sorrow. It's with great happiness and an overwhelming sense of why wasn't I here? And as Rachel said, there is an urgency to this. We're getting old. We're dying. There are less people now than there were 10 years ago, 20 years ago. The youngest of us would be in their early 50s. And when you look at the Aboriginal life expectancy, that's actually quite old for us and getting older for us. Two such people only recently died. Jack Charles and Archie Roach. Jack and Archie were both stolen children. Both had troubled lives because of their removal. Both spent much of their lives looking for their place in the world, Archie through music and Jack through acting and storytelling. The point of me mentioning them? Simply, they were well known. However, most stolen children are not. They are as anonymous to you, they are anonymous to you and me. And they don't have others to help them. This is where the importance of those who hold information and records is never greater. Accordingly, the responsibility of record management and information holders is simply not to manage documents. It is, as much, it is much more than this. In the case of the stolen children, it is giving people the chance to fill the void of unknowing, the opportunity, for the, the opportunity of those most effective to, affected to find some peace. It's probably one thing I actually look for in my life is peace. Peace within myself and therefore peace for others around me. And I think that's true of all the stolen children. It is in this spirit that I am grateful beyond description that the Council of Australasian Archives and Record Authorities, State and Territory Information Commissioners, Privacy Commissioners and Births, Deaths and Marriage Registrars have all worked with the Healing Foundation's Historical Records Task Force to develop the principles for, the nationally, for a nationally consistent approach to accessing stolen generations records. That's a really long way of saying these people want to help. They want to do the right thing. They recognise that their job is so much more than just managing an efficient and effective bureaucracy. And I am eternally grateful, I am really grateful for this group of people to want to work with us to do it. I have my papers but there are so many who don't. And it actually really matters. It really matters to people beyond just knowing who you are. Proactively supporting access to records for stolen generations people is one of the key actions needed to help healing from trauma of removal. It means for many, as it did for me, that the story of your life is real, that your experience is valid, and that's how you see and understand yourself is no longer brought into question. In essence, it is bringing the truth into light. It also helps us raise a question, and this is me ad libbing, the question of redress. Once you know who you are, once it's confirmed who you are in your own mind, the question of redress comes up. I urge and encourage the Queensland Government to establish a redress scheme for the stolen generations. There's only two jurisdictions that don't have it, Western Australia and Queensland. If the Queensland Government wants help doing it, call me, I'm easy to find. I helped set up the Victorian one, I helped set up the Commonwealth one. I did the same thing to the Western Australian Minister for Aboriginal Affairs about three weeks ago, um, so I'm doing it here in Queensland. This cannot wait, this can't be open to political discussion, this must be done and done now. All this, however, is at the individual level. What does this mean for the nation? We're in an age where the catch cry of truth telling is often repeated, but what does it really mean and what is its consequence? It's as true for a nation as it is for a person. The older you get, the more things you have in your past that you would rather not talk about. We, we all as people have regrets. So do sovereign states. Australia is no different from many other sovereign states in its history. We are also no better or no worse. Like people, nations should not sit in judgment of each other's stories. That needs to be left to the peoples of that nation themselves. 
It is a sign of the maturity of a nation if it can look into the mirror of itself and own what it sees. Australia is at a critical point in its journey. We stand at a fork in the road and must decide which path we take. Are we brave enough to confront the longer, harder, but ultimately more substantial road of disclosure? Or will we, or will we turn away and take the easy road of denial and selective narrative that tells us only what we want to hear, not what we should and have to hear? It is a choice that for all of us, for the lack of a better term, have skin in the game with. And it's not a black and white discussion either, for want of another term. And it is a difficult game to play as there, there may be no set of rules, at least beyond what we assume, which not, which may ne which not, which not necessarily may be right anyway. Essentially, to embark on the processes associated with truth-telling implies that you are ready to see and hear the things that, are that may be decidedly uncomfortable and equally unexpected. A proper truth-telling process is not all one-way traffic. Let me be clear about that. It's not all one-way traffic. Things will emerge that will make everyone, and I mean everyone, reflect and ask, is this who we really are? And that is not a bad thing. In fact, it's a decidedly good thing. It is a sign of a maturing nation that we can and are prepared to expose ourselves to the broader story of how our country has evolved to where it is today. What form or forms these processes take needs to be determined by each jurisdiction. For example, my own state of Victoria has established the Yaruk Justice Commission, the Commission has the powers of a Royal Commission, but it's doing it through an Aboriginal process. It's doing something which, which carries our culture at its very core. It's more interested in hearing and listening rather than Royal Commission, how Royal Commissions usually work by extracting information from people and entities. Queensland, as part of its treaty process, may decide on a different but equally valid process. The important part is, by, is participation by as many people as possible. Why? Because truth-telling is a way of healing. A country like a person can be healed by understanding its whole story. It, the things that make it the way it is. It should not be about attribution of blame. That's easy to do. It's easy to find fault with others. It's easy to point the finger. But it shouldn't be about attribution of blame. But acceptance that we have a wider shared history that we all must own. Make no mistake, we must undertake this. For too long, we have not confronted the unsavoury parts of who Australia is. For too long, we have let the schism between, between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians widen and rot the bedrock of what should be our national identity. As Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. The consequence of not looking deeply at ourselves is to contemplate us as a failed nation, a failed state. Think about that for a minute. If we don't do this, we will have failed as a country. Equally though, we should not let ourselves be bogged down in the past. The point of learning from the broader sweep of historical and contemporary events, and it's important to say contemporary events because we still live this every day. The actions of a senator, one of the senators yesterday in the House, um, in the Senate itself, shows we have a vast, shows we have a long way to go in this country a very long way to go. It wasn't about an Aboriginal issue, but it just shows that contemporary events play a part of who we are, not just historical ones. And we need to learn from these events so that we don't repeat the same mistakes again and help complete the blank pages of the book that is the Australian story. Then and only then can we move forward as a people and as a country. And move forward we must, for we face many challenges. Climate change, 
inter international geopolitics and our place in it, the economy, the place of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the national narrative, to name a few. And the issues around Aboriginal people are big at the moment. We have the Uluru Statement. We have the voice, a re potential referendum. And the referendum is more than just a mechanism for Aboriginal view into government about things that affect us. It is so much more than that. This referendum is a referendum on the place of Aboriginal people in our country if it was just about a mechanism for administrative input into the thinking of government, sure, but it's not. What comes out of that referendum will be, does the rest of the country think that Aboriginal people should be able to speak with their own voice on their own terms, or not? This is as important as the 1967 referendum, which made us ultimately citizens in our own country, the next part is do we have a right to be heard as citizens in our own country on our own terms? I think the people who supporting this referendum and the people who don't support this referendum should really contemplate that deeper question and not just the shallow one of do we need this separate mechanism? Because we don't get a chance to revisit this. Not in my lifetime. I'm nearly 60 years old. Um, I'm Aboriginal, we're not going to do this again for at least one generation. Not that I don't plan on being around, if I could be, but, you know, there's every chance I won't be. So those who are, those, as we go forward, we need to contemplate that deeper question. The point is we will not be able to meet the, these challenges until we better, us, better understand ourselves and our capacities and our capabilities. And one of those needed attributes is the ability to not only learn and own our own story, but to heal and to forgive. Not forget, but to forgive ourselves. And to dedicate our efforts to not only ensuring that we do not relive the past, but that we make a future where everyone feels like they have a place and they belong. Much the same as the belonging you get from a welcome to country that affords you the peace that you feel like you have somewhere to belong and that you have a place. And at the end of the day, isn't, isn't that all that any of us ask for? Thank you.